So as we gather for this event from across Australia, we recognize that many of us are on different lands of different traditional custodians. I would like to acknowledge all of the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are all present today, different parts of Australia, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating and attending this webinar. The College of Law pays its deep respects to each of their elders, past, present, and emerging. So before we move on to the panel questions, I'd like to take some time to first introduce our panelists that are at least here at the moment. And I'll also briefly introduce the others just in case. And I think that'll give you more context as to why we're having this webinar in the first place, and also help hopefully give you a better understanding of the background of the panelists and the type of questions you may want to ask for them. Now, I'll only start off first by briefly introducing myself because it's through my current role at the college that I've had an opportunity to come across students with questions about regional practice. So I am myself a lawyer. I've been practicing for more than 10 years, but I've never practiced in the regions. So um, this topic itself and the discussions we're gonna have, it's gonna be a great learning lesson for me. Now, my current role with the college, I get to deal with a lot of stakeholders. And amongst my biggest stakeholder group is law students. And as part of my engagement with these students, I do get asked a lot of questions about regional practice. Some of the things that I've been asked are issues related to distance, access to technology and court resources, remuneration, and specialization. And so what I was hoping to do through this webinar is to bring together a group of experienced regional practitioners who can hopefully help demystify some of the uncertainties related to those particular issues I addressed, or in the very least, help alleviate some significant concerns any students may have about regional practice. And in particular, I've been, um, the kinds of issues that have been raised with me have been from students who are in universities in regional areas, or their students may be in the city campuses, but they're originally from the regions, and they're wondering whether they should go back and practice there. And so these issues come up often enough that I felt it was a good idea to put on a webinar about regional practice in particular. And in doing so, I wanted to bring together panelists that I thought would provide excellent insights into these various questions. And I've been fortunate that three of the panelists are actually not only um, have experience as regional practitioners or academics, but they're also adjunct lecturers with the College of Law. And I'll just go through introducing all four of them, although we have two of them with us for present time, um, and um, do that in alphabetical order. And then we'll start off with the questions. So first I'd like to introduce you to Andrew White. He spent most of his legal career in regional New South Wales. He's been practicing for over 25 years in the beautiful Blue Mountains. For those of you who've never visited, it's a beautiful part of New South Wales, and I've absolutely loved the time I spent there. Now, Andrew advises in planning and property law, wills and estates, commercial and business transactions, and elder law. So as you can see, very much a generalist practice. Andrew also holds a master's of law in wills and estates, which he actually obtained from the College of Law. So he's one of our alumni. And Andrew's a board member of the Elizabeth Evett Community Legal Center, and he's been a member for over 35 years. Andrew is also notary public and immediate past president of the Blue Mountains Regional Law Society. Next, I'll introduce Kate, who's also joining us um, at this time. So Kate, as I said, is an adjunct lecturer with the College of Law in New South Wales. She's been working in legal profession since 1994, initially as a legal technology paralegal, and then working in the very earliest paperless courtrooms. Very big now, of course, paperless. Since 2003, Kate has worked in the New South Wales Southern Highlands, working in a boutique generalist firm, and progressively specializing in family law. In 2016, Kate completed her master's of law in family law, I think with the College of Law as well. And since 2017, uh, we've been very fortunate that she's joined as one of our adjunct lecturers, as I mentioned before. And as an adjunct lecturer, Kate um, continues to have her own practice, but um, is helping the college on that basis that she does part-time as an adjunct. As a solicitor in regional rural New South Wales, Kate has gained a wealth of experience handling diverse range of matters for her clients. While specializing in family law, she considers herself a general practitioner, assisting clients in various forms of alternative dispute resolution, as well as traditional regulation, uh, litigation, my apologies, 
appearing regularly in both state and federal courts. Now, just because of the time frame, we've already gotten 10 minutes into it, and we don't have our two other panelists yet. We might just start off with um, speaking with Kate and with Andrew. And I appreciate that um, you're both from regional New South Wales, but I think everything you're going to talk about in terms of the, the questions that um, I'm going to ask you about will be reflective of the kind of issues that come up in regional rural practice in any case. And so we might start off with you first, Andrew. So I briefly introduced your background, but I think will be really helpful for all of our participants to know is maybe share a little bit of anything extra that I haven't already touched upon in terms of biography and particularly how that's motivated you to be a regional practitioner. So any insights you can give to our audience would be wonderful in that respect. Uh, thanks, Marco. I have to clarify one thing. I'm no longer on the board of the Elizabeth Everett Community Legal Centre, um, but I was on the board for 25, 30 years or something like that. So um, I guess uh, one of the reasons that I originally uh, moved into rural and regional practice was um, because my now wife came from the regional area of Lithgow. And I, whilst I was studying, I thought that I would see if there was a job available in the town on a part-time basis, and, uh, and I got a job. And that's, so that was the, what initiated me into rural and regional practice. Uh, and I found very quickly that it was a very, um, it's a form of fast-tracking into the law, because I found, particularly after I'd done College of Law, that a lot of my colleagues that I went through college with uh, were working for medium sized and large size city firms, but they were very limited in the sort of work that they were able to do. They were you know, doing discovery for six months or something like that. Whereas before I was even um, admitted, I was appearing in court. I was running my own files under the supervision of my, my um, um, the, the, the license holder of the practice. Uh, and I got very quickly a wide range of experience and exposure to various elements of practice, which I found very helpful. And that's not just my story. Um, other colleagues that I've since met who practice regionally have told the same story. They, it, it's, it's a form of fast tracking. You take on experience uh, and expertise at an earlier stage in your career and you're exposed to a wide range of legal issues, depending on what areas you wish to practice in. And it's being part of a community too. So you actually get to know the other practitioners in your area on a personal basis, um, which it's a bit old school, I know, but I still believe that that's um, a worthwhile relationship in that you can trust people or you can learn to trust people. So if, if I'm dealing with a local practitioner and I give my word on an issue, they know that they can trust me. Whereas if you're um, in a, um, say in the city where there are so many more solicitors uh, practicing, it's very hard to establish those relationships of trust. Thanks very much for that, Andrew. You've touched upon a number of great issues which we'll actually get to address as well as part of the later questions. Uh, I think it's important that you've addressed the fact that um, at least within your practice, and that was part of your biography that I introduced, that you get to do a wide range of matters. And I've heard the same thing from other regional practitioners. And um, one of the issues that has come up uh, that I've heard from students is just the, the ability to be able to specialize if you're in regional practice. Now, I know that if you're in family law or criminal law, that um, those tend to be tied together and you can do quite a bit of it. But my presumption is if you're doing wills and estates and property law, um, again, they're tied together. And um, is it the case, and um, from your perspective, that if you are in um, having your background and, of course, dealing with other practitioners in the region, whether um, there would be uh, any ways for lawyers to specialize if they wanted to in regional practice, or is it just let's say from a commercial perspective or from a community perspective, because you know so many people within the community, whether it's better to have um, as many practice areas as you're uh, capable and confident of uh, being part of. I guess that depends on the size of the firm. 
Um, I, I think statistically, most regional practitioners are sole practitioners. And I think uh, it would be more difficult to specialise as a sole practitioner. Although here in the Blue Mountains, we have a sole practitioner who, who is a wills and estates specialist. Uh, and basically that's the only sort of work that, that he does. So the possibility exists. And I think certainly with larger regional firms, uh, there, there is increasingly more specialisation uh, because they're able to still offer the community a wide range of legal services, but they're um, able within their firm to have people who, who um, practise within a limited area. So I think traditionally in rural and regional areas, as you touched on there, there are a lot more family law specialists, criminal law specialists, mm -hmm. because there's still a, quite a bit of that work in a regional context. Um, when you get into more esoteric areas of practice, I guess it, it becomes a little bit more difficult to specialise, but um, yeah. Okay, thanks for that, Andrew. Now, Kate, before I move on to you, um, I did get a, a question about um, just my name as a host. Thank you for that, Jamie. And so, Damien, so what's happened is I think uh, I forgot to introduce myself properly. So I'll do that now. Um, and also I wanted to type my response, um, but I think I hit the wrong button and uh, put answer live. So I'll do that now. And then in the future, I'll type out the answer. So myself, my name is Marco Novikov. I'm a um, manager here at the College of Law. As I mentioned earlier, I've been a lawyer for more than 10 years. But the role I have now is predominantly based on business development and relationship management activities. And so I deal with a lot of stakeholders that include law students and lawyers. Um, if you wanted to, I'm actually accessing this Zoom webinar through our College of Law Zoom account. And that's why my name doesn't show up. But I believe it was in the uh, social media post from the college just to get my full name. And in that respect, and I'll I'll of course leave it up to each of the panelists to comment on this, but if you wanted to um, connect with me, most certainly I'm on LinkedIn and um, you'll be able to uh, uh, just do that. So I type, um, it's M-A-R-K-O, Marco, and then Novakov, N-O-V-A-K-O-V. -O -O now, Damien, I did see your next question um, and we might save that towards the end because it's not specifically related to regional rural practice. Um, and, um, oh, thankfully, we've got Tracy on board with us. Hello, Tracy. Thank Hello. Sorry, there seemed to be some sort of issue with um, connecting. No worries at all. Just glad to have you on board. We've already started with some brief introductions. Um, and I did ask the first question we had was um, just a little bit learning a little bit more about our panelists. And I was going to move on to Kate next. And then after I get um, Kate for you, just to answer that first question I had about what's motivated you to um, practice in the regions, I then might move on to introduce you a little bit more, Tracy, about your biography, and then ask you the same question, if that's all right. Brilliant. So Kate, if we can just move on to that same question I had for Andrew, but for yourself, if you don't mind. Thank you. Oh, gosh. Um, I don't feel like I was particularly motivated. It was It was really by chance that I ended up practicing as a lawyer in what the Southern Highlands, I feel like it, it's kind of a unique area. It's kind of semi-regional, semi-rural. We're kind of um, an hour and a half or two hours north of Canberra, um, same distance from Sydney. Um, I have access, I mean, really what that means is I have access to quite a number of court registries to pick from. Um, but I mean, when I say by chance in my biography that Marco read out, you, um, I was involved in legal IT out of school and loved it. And, and I was complaining to the director of that company that I had no tertiary education. And he suggested that I do what was then called SAB law or a diploma of law through the Solicitors Admission Board, uh, which is now LPAB, the Legal Practitioners Admission Board. And that would be essentially. Um, an arts degree. So I finished secondary school in the Southern Highlands as, and as um, most students tend to um, desire, I wanted to get out of the Highlands into a CBD. Moved to the CBD, obtained a job in legal IT, um, started my tertiary education. Um, life, family, relationships 
brought me back to the Highlands um, where I then completed my law degree. Um, while I was completing my law degree, I was working as a paralegal in a boutique law firm in the Southern Highlands. And when I completed my qualifications and was admitted, I was offered a job as an employed solicitor. And that firm specialised in family law. I Just because I was immersed in that area of law, I became, um, I just developed depth of knowledge um, in that uh, particular area. As well as, um, as Andrew I didn't, um, was talking about, you, you get a spattering of everything. Mm. Um, conveyancing, uh, sale of business, leases, wills and estates, family provision claims, a little bit of civil litigation. I suppose the only thing I haven't been um, involved in is any criminal law, interestingly enough, employment law. And uh, whilst I, I'm not an accredited specialist in family law, I've just been working in that area for most of my practising life. Um, the benefit of working in this area is that uh, in a close-knit community is that you learn, you quickly learn and you have that support network of other colleagues around you that do have a knowledge in an area that um, you don't. So, for example, I have a client that um, had a, uh, an easement issue that was just outside of my speciality, but there's a local practitioner who I know that, that loves that type of um, issue, uh, is, is, has that knowledge that I don't have and I was able to say look you know I can't help but here go and talk to Peter down the road um, and it goes both ways so Peter will have a client that comes to see him um, and it's about a family law matter and he'll say oh not going to touch that with the barge pole um, <laughs> so yeah that's I mean it's it was really by chance so I grew up in the highlands I wanted to escape to the city um, and then uh, life life to, returned me back to the highlands where i have a you know support network family um mm. and uh yeah that's where i practice thanks for that kate um it's very interesting some of the matters you've touched upon are issues that i've um, heard from law students but also when i was doing a bit of my own research about regional practice as well as to what brings people back to the regions and it's a one of them is the community um and you've mentioned referrals and it's the same thing you were talking about earlier andrew that you know each other very well and it's a sense of community and you have that trust. So between each other as practitioners, you're able to refer the work um, and you feel confident and happy to do, do so. And um, one of the um, other issues you brought up, Kate, was that you grew up in the regions and then you were in the highlands and you were looking to escape to go to the city. It's not the first time I heard that. Um, again, particularly dealing with law students now, I, I get that quite often. And then they say, um, well, I'm thinking of going back, but I'm worried about these reasons. Some of the ones that I mentioned earlier was access to resources, distance, all of that. But it's quite clear from what Andrew's pointed out and what you're saying now is maybe those aren't significant concerns anymore. I know that some of the firms in the regions are getting bigger and bigger, like medium size, and you'll have up to 10 solicitors doing a variety of work. So clearly there's ability there to not only specialize, but have that access to technology. And I'm right now we're all together on a webinar Tracy, you mentioned some tech issues, but you're still here. Um, and I, I think that just um, is more evidence that maybe perhaps these concerns once existed about um, access to resources and technology may not be as important uh, now or, or, is, or is an issue now as they used to be. But we'll get along with some of those um, questions later on because I, I specifically have questions about the impact of technology. What I might do now, Tracy, is just introduce you in terms of your biography, and then I'll ask you the same question after that, which is, aside from everything I read up from your biography, what motivated you to have that experience in regional practice, and also what you do now in your current role? So in um, talking about Tracy, she's again, as I mentioned earlier, one of our adjunct lecturers in Queensland. She's worked with the college for over 12 years, doing teaching, assessing, and mentoring across all subjects in the practical legal training program. Tracy's been a lawyer for around 25 years, practicing in commercial law, residential, business conveyancing, franchising, wills, probate, estate litigation, administrative, disciplinary law, employment law, governance, corporate governance, e-commerce, and privacy law. All right, so that was a lot to say. <laughs> but what I think it demonstrates is exactly what Kate and Andrew were talking about, is in the regions, you have that capacity to practice across so many different areas um, and ability to learn a lot from that. And of course, to help your clients. 
Now, uh, Tracy's worked in private legal practice in the Northern Territory and Queensland. And of course, Tracy, you've managed your own practice as well. She's worked for the Queensland Law Society, and I did that last year myself, Tracy, um, as a senior solicitor in the regulation and licensing team. Tracy also teaches the business law course at the University of the Sunshine Coast in Queensland and is the lecturer in charge of the civil procedure and alternative dispute resolution course at the Australian Catholic University in Brisbane. So wow, quite a bit of information there, Tracy, but I think what your biographies highlighted like with the, our other panelists is you've had this experience in regional practice, but what you're doing now is a little bit more on the academic side, but I'd be really interested for the purposes of this webinar because it's focused on regional practice. I'd be interested to get more um, of your insights as to what prompted you or motivated you to practice in the regions. Did you want to return for any particular reason um, or was it just that you were always there and thought this is where I wanted to remain? And sorry, go ahead, Tracy. Yeah, probably a couple of motivations, one of which was when it came to the Northern Territory, I was there in 1989. So that tells you that's quite a long time ago. Uh, and I happened to be living there at the time. And uh, so I fell into practice there quite easily after having done my law degree and so on. And I actually did what was then articles of clerkship. Of course, we don't do that now. We do practical legal training. Uh, but back then it was articles of clerkship and you dutifully sat on the back bench with your master solicitor and uh, did all your practical training then, which also I might add included going to to buy the chips for happy hour on Friday. That was a very important part of the article clerk's job. <laughs> uh, but you also did what I consider to be sort of really ground level stuff. You, you'd literally walk all over town and do things like delivering documents, picking things up, you know, serving documents, going to the court to do certain things, dealing with probate applications. So you'd be literally walking around town actually doing those things in Darwin back then. And uh, so you did everything from scratch. When you drafted a will, you didn't have a computer. We had two computers in the whole firm. And so we typed everything and you had to get it right. Otherwise, scratch it out, off it goes, get a new piece of paper back again. Uh, so, and you drafted everything from scratch. So, um, to cut a long story short, uh, I worked for a really great firm there. It was very well established with really experienced partners. And I got to deal with all sorts of different areas of law. And I learned from this, the beginning, you know, basically I learned to draft documents by sort of stripping them back to nothing and building them myself, which made me uh, a good drafts person. Eventually, it took me a long time, but um, so I got experience there and I got to deal with different areas of law and different people, different clients that I would never have experienced elsewhere. Darwin's pretty unique for those of you who've been there. And, you know, it, it's basically a small city with, with a lot of resources. So, you know, I got to deal with all sorts of different clients, government, educational institutions, private clients, developers, a wealth of uh, experience you, you couldn't you really almost couldn't get that elsewhere so I, I highly recommend you know that sort of experience I know that for many people Darwin seems pretty remote and it is but there's an awful lot to be gained there for a solicitor there really is so I guess that's Darwin and then I um, kind of uh, made my way to Queensland with my family and ended up working regionally again it wasn't really intentional uh, but here I am again, I'm based on the Sunshine Coast. Um, yes, I do quite a bit of work in Brisbane. And, um, and can I just say that my technical problems uh, are, are happening while I'm in Brisbane, not on the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> and it's Telstra's know. fault. <laughs> <laughs> so, but again, regionally, um, you know, the sort of work that you're able to, to get the depth of the work and, and, the, and the quality and the, con the quantity of it is quite exceptional. You know, um, I've, I've worked in the area of deceased estate litigation for the last few years as a consultant, and there's a lot of work there. Uh, it's very interesting. It's varied. There's a lot of property work here on the coast and certainly plenty of wills and estates and that sort of thing. And, and, and broader issues too. 
so that that to me um, is very appealing. Thanks yeah. very much, Tracy. I'm really glad you touched upon a number of issues that I think are relevant. One of them is just access to good work, interesting work, access to clients and a variety of clients. And I think that's important to highlight to um, those of us who are attending in the audience today that might have those concerns about, well, will I get that interesting work? What kind of clients will I work with? Clearly, you can work with um, the people that need help that the client facing, but also more that corporate and government, uh, government side of things as well. So I'm really glad to hear that. Now, just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip on to ask some other questions that flow through from what we've discussed. And I might just um, show, but I've got your question, and my apologies if I've mispronounced your name. You've asked the question about working remotely. I'm going to ask the panelists a question about use of technology in the regions. Uh, we've got some good feedback already from Tracy, but I'll, I'll want to nail that down a bit further, and I think that'll answer your question as well. So I might move on to the second questions. Um, second question, and um, this is open to everyone uh, to answer in no particular order. Um, just feel free to jump in. But what I'm interested in um, hearing a little bit more about um, is definitely the benefits of working in the regions, but also any issues you think that are areas for development for regional practitioners or for assistance to regional practitioners in terms of what somebody might consider a drawback. And um, I put that on lightly, not because I want students to be discouraged, but it's good to have that full and frank discussion about both benefits and any potential drawbacks. And um, only because of the limited time frame that we have, just hoping one or two minutes from each of you, just about things you'd like to highlight um, that maybe the students should know or that you've experienced from your perspective. But again, um, noting that um, the perspective you have might be different from other regional practitioners, but it's good to hear directly from you as well. So I opened up the floor to anyone who'd like to start. Andrew? Uh, yes, I, I think um, ironically somewhat, um, COVID has been a boon to regional practice in that uh, it's forced or it forced the court systems in particular uh, to um, not require personal attendance at, at call overs and, and so there's there's uh, it's been I've, I've personally found that it's it's a great benefit to be able to um, attend a call over either by telephone or video link uh, and it seems that the various courts are continuing those practices um, post COVID, although we're still in COVID to some extent. Uh, so I think that's been a burn for regional and rural practice. Um, one other thing that crossed my mind whilst um, Tracy was talking was, we tend to think of regional and rural practice as being private practice. But of course, there are other opportunities for other forms of practice. I was, for example, an in-house lawyer for the Blue Mountain City Council for a number of years. Uh, and I've had other colleagues that have worked for uh, government bodies, you know, New South Wales Water and things like that that have offices in regional areas. So, so there is the opportunity to have, um, I suppose you'd call it government practice as well as private practice. Um, so there, yeah, which may be of interest to some of the, 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 the people who are with us today. So. Thank you so much for that, Andrew, and I'm really glad you raised that. I, I hadn't personally thought about asking it, um, and uh, now I've been better informed, but that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, you could work for a government or a corporation, um, even the largest ones that have offices in the region. So um, the opportunities are probably more abound than um, potentially some students know right now, and um, I'm clearly an example of someone that didn't even think that far about those kinds of opportunities. So thank you for sharing that with us. It's really good to know. Um, and again, I might open up the floor to Tracy and Kate just to uh, maybe perhaps address some similar issues or, or, or different issues that Andrew's touched upon. Um, I mean, I would say whilst the close-knit community of fellow colleagues is fantastic, it can also have its drawbacks in that you are regularly dealing with the same solicitor. So you, whilst you get to know their negotiation style, um, um, that can be uh, quite predictable. 
Um, and so matters tend to, particularly family law matters, might tend to follow the same route when, you know, you might prefer that they didn't go down the litigation route um, uh, because of um, the solicitor that the other side has retained. Um, uh, the other thing you need to be conscious of, again, with working in um, semi-rural, rural and regional areas is um, it's not six degrees of separation. It would be like a, a 0.25 of, it, of one degree. Um, so you um, you always need to be aware of doing those conflict checks and confidentiality and your um, legal professional privilege and, and just your overall ethical considerations. Whilst, you know, you always need to have those at the forefront of your mind. Um, it's more than likely, you know, I've had a family law matter where I've had to contemplate, is it too close to home? I've acted for the, and it was all done by consent of the other side, but this um, same husband, but I've acted for three of the people that have been married to that same fellow. So, <laughs> um, so it's not, not a drawback. Um, but just uh, something that you, perhaps in a uh, in a CBD um, you've got uh, just more people. Um, that's all I've got to say. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. And uh, again, you've touched upon some real important issues that have been raised with me before, but also through my research. And one of them is those degrees of separation are so small that it's almost like you have to be a model citizen, but everyone's friend and you can get stopped to say, hey, my um, my child has this problem, or my aunt or uncle has this legal problem. What do you what do you recommend? Um, so it's good that um, it, it's something to be aware of, but it also at the same time uh, it gives you that access to community if you wanted that. Um, but just be to be mindful of it. So again, there's the 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 uh, potential there's benefits and drawbacks just in that um, community involvement as well. And it's good to, upon the other. Uh, things you've touched upon. Again, these are typical issues that have been raised with me um, by law students. And so it's good to get your perspective on that as well. Now, um, we've just been joined by Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. So um, Paul earlier was at the uh, Fair Work Commission, and I'm happy for you to correct me for um, any way I described that incorrectly for one of his matters. So he's joining us a little bit late, but thank you in any case, uh, Paul, for joining us. And I, I hope it all went well for you. Um, what I might do is, uh, before I move on to um, Tracy, to uh, just asking you that same question, Paul, um, I've been asking some, I've introduced each of the panelists, I've asked them certain questions, and what we'll do is we'll keep moving along. Um, but what I might do is first hear from Tracy just about the question I've asked, and then I'd like to introduce your biography um, a little bit more and then just ask you a question about you know, your motivations and being a regional practitioner. And then I'll follow through with the remaining questions on my list. So I hope that's okay with everyone. But Tracy, it'd be great to hear from you from that same question I asked from Andrew and Kate. Yeah, thanks, Marco. I think, you know, Andrew and Kate have uh, made some important points about that. And I, and I guess one of the things I would add is the, the flip side of that, that, you know, acting for several people in the same family and, and having people stop you in the streets. That does happen sometimes. Uh, and I guess it's a great reminder for us as solicitors that, um, you know, we have a duty of confidentiality uh, and that we have to be very careful and, and somewhat self-disciplined, particularly in a smaller community. But I think the good thing about that too, there's a couple of good things. One, one thing is that it makes you accountable and responsible as a solicitor, as well as being just a member of the, the community. Uh, and it makes you realise that you are very much a part of the community and that you have an important role to play. And it gives you a better sense of where you fit into it too, I think. Um, you're not just one of a large number of people and, and you could sort of fly under the radar and maybe you could, uh, you know, not uh, conduct yourself perhaps as well as you might otherwise uh, on any given day and perhaps get away with it. In mm -hmm. a small community, I know I've experienced this when I was in the Northern Territory, you cannot get away with poor behaviour as a solicitor, really. Mm -hmm. People will call you out on it. It is noticeable and it damages your reputation and your brand, which is really important as a solicitor. 
Uh, and, and I think that connection to community is one of the really key things about working uh, regionally. You know, it's a, a really great rewarding aspect of being a solicitor in a regional area. And, uh, and, I, and I don't think you miss out on anything by, by being a regional solicitor. Thanks very much for that, Tracy. And I think that our audience will certainly appreciate that. And it seems to be the sentiment that's echoed by all of the other panelists so far that have had the chance to speak. And um, yes, conflict of interest, uh, model citizen, all those kinds of things where your reputation is your brand, you get work through referrals, as was discussed earlier. So it's good to know that um, the opportunities are there. You just gotta be mindful as if any of the concerns you have working in the city or the suburbs, because um, being a city practitioner will have its benefits, but also its potential drawbacks in that way as well. So it's good to know where you are, um, where you get your work from, and um, at the same time, the opportunities available for being as part of a close-knit community. Now, Paul, thank you again for joining us. I do appreciate you had a matter on um, earlier uh, this afternoon, and I'm glad that you're able to join us now. What I might do is just briefly introduce you by way of um, your biography, and then once I finish, I'd like to just quickly get from you a sense of what's motivated you to be a regional practitioner. But I'll start first with your background. So Paul is also one of uh, our adjunct lecturers here at the College of Law in Victoria. Paul completed his law degree at Deakin Uni in Geelong, uh, Victoria, 2006. He's the principal of Law on Lilliard, which is a small boutique firm based in Ballarat, which is a beautiful tourist region of Victoria. Paul also volunteers his time at a local community legal center to give back to the regional community where he lives. Um, we heard the same thing from Andrew, of course. And uh, most importantly, as um, I've learned a lot from being here in Melbourne, although Canadian by background, I've, I've had my time to assimilate. Paul is a passionate follower of the Geelong AFL team. And I had the pleasure of watching my first ever AFL game on Sunday where I watched the Hawks and uh, the Saints go at it. and um, Having spent most of my time in Queensland and watching um, the Broncos, for example, play and the Cowboys and seeing everything else, it's just amazing to um, experience the kind of energy you get both watching um, rugby and AFL. But I'll leave that as that. Um, and I might just jump on, Paul, to ask you a little bit more about what has really motivated you to practice in the regions um, and any sort of insights you can provide in that respect. Well, I mean, it was a, it was a lifestyle thing, or it was a, a life choice thing. In that, I was practicing in the CBD of Melbourne, and a client that I had there, a major client that we had, was regionally based. Um, and well, I was living in Ballarat at the time, but commuting to Melbourne and back, which is a good two hours each way each day. So that's a significant, by far the biggest probably advantage that I've had among many others of practicing regionally in my local area um, in a, a town with a population of about 110,000 that basically that um, regionally based client then put the seeds of in, into my mind about setting up practice locally why not um, do it why not take advantage of the advantages of um, being able to tap into the local network for clients to service her as well of course um, and also to drop to um take the commute out of it so that's why i ended up doing what something i'd never ever thought i would actually do to be honest because of hey if i'm starting up my own business as a lawyer well where's my clients going to come from i had a client with two major matters on at the same time from the day one so that was a kickstart um so that, that's really how the regional thing has come about um and I don't see any drawbacks, to be honest. I, I think there used to be this idea that you miss out on a, a lot by not tapping into the Melbourne network, but particularly now that COVID has resulted in many things being done virtually online, um, that, that, that advantage of being physically in Melbourne um, just doesn't exist anymore because I, A, I can travel to Melbourne if I want to or when I want to and when I can, and B, I do matters that are Australia-based anyway, so where I'm located is completely irrelevant. In fact, I don't even meet some of my clients. In fact, the client who I just did then in an employment law matter, they're based in Queensland. So my location is completely irrelevant. Thanks very much for that, Paul. Um, so many great issues to touch upon. And um, 
you're echoing some of the discussions that we've had earlier um, when we started the webinar, which was the fact that uh, when you're in the regions, you can get clients really quickly and do a lot all at once. Mm. Those issues related to technology are not as significant anymore. Um, and that um, I think in your particular case, when you're doing something like industrial relations, which is based on federal legislation, yeah. it's yeah. very easy to be a... Um, a solicitor in one part of the country doing work for a, a client in another. And I guess that would be the same with you, uh, Kate, if it was family law. I know there's slight variations in WA, um, but aside from that, uh, family law, just like um, employment relations, industrial law is uh, federally governed. Now, um, one of the things that, uh, because again, of time frame, I'm trying to move on to ask as many questions as I can. I want to keep it as relevant as possible too. Um, Andrew, you started off by pointing out that technology is um, not so much of an issue anymore, particularly because of COVID, and it's given you opportunity to have remote attendances rather than popping in person, for example, for callovers and things like that. You've pointed out the exact same thing, Paul, and what I might do is just from each of the panelists, feel free, whoever wants to start, is what I'm really interested in is knowing um, the benefits of technology now, how they've assisted you in legal practice and the changes you've seen uh, both uh, pre-COVID and now um, the times we're in where it's still COVID, but kind of post-COVID. And at the same time, um, where you see that technology going, and if you think technology is one way to give more of an incentive to junior lawyers to do what you've done, Paul, for example, is if they're already in the CBD, but maybe they're in the regions or thought about going in the regions, they have less of a concern now because of the emergence of technology, but I open it up to everyone. Uh, if I may speak. Um, Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I think um, with the plethora of practice management systems that are now available to uh, solicitors, uh, uh, that's made a huge difference. I think when I was first practicing regionally, if I needed a precedent or I needed to do further research, it was basically, contact the Law Society Library and they would send out a, one of the, the practices, you know, the, say it's on wills and estates practice in a, in a, a written form, uh, which I would then research, blah, blah, blah. Uh, now, of course, um, so much legal information is online. Uh, it's readily accessible and it does, you know, as Paul said, it doesn't matter where you are. Just as long as you've got an internet connection, you can you can plug in. You can get access to case law um, precedents through your practice management system, uh, and you know practice is much more streamlined as a consequence. I mean, my firm was a very early adopter of the Leap system back in the late nineteen nineties, uh, and you know we found that having you know I'm not. I'm not um, advocating leap necessarily, but it's just the one, it was one of the earlier ones that came out. Uh, and having that system, I, I think it's probably saved our practice one full-time employee since the time that we adopted it in terms of administration. Uh, and it just makes practice a lot easier. Uh, and I guess being an older practitioner, I've seen the transition from what was essentially a paper-based um, form of practice to what is now essentially a digital form of practice. Uh, so I don't think that there's any real handicap to practicing regionally anymore from that perspective anyway. Very much for that insight. I don't want to interrupt anyone else who's going to speak next. I might just add for those of you who are law students that are unfamiliar with practice management systems like LEAP, um, it it does many things, but one of them, for example, uh, would be recording your billable hours. So just think about your learning portal that you have now through your university, and then just having a whirlwind of other functions related to actual legal practice. But I'll just leave that at that. And then again, open it up to anyone else who would like to just comment further on some of the matters that Andrew's touched upon. I'll, I'll um, just briefly mention something that's happened just today in, in the same way what Andrew talked about, where what well, um, slightly different, that in the old days, or when I started practice, if you wanted to get a precedent or a case or some legislation, I'd walk down in the Melbourne CBD, that is, to the to the law library, to the Supreme Court library or to the LIV library, actually, what I'm talking about. This morning, I put a research request in for precedent to do with a commercial litigation matter. And 
access to that particular subscription service, which I paid for as part of my membership of the LIV, LIV, has now been given to me. So I'm going to be able to do the research or want to get my precedent from my office and not, not move anywhere. So there's a live, a live current example of another advantage that law is being practiced, um, or another example as well as law is being practiced differently now to what it used to be, and it's changing. Thanks very much for that, Paul. Clearly, and sorry for interrupting, Kate, but clearly that subscription service is helpful. I mean, as law students, they would have access to potentially LexisNexis through the unis, mm. but as well as obviously the free version. But that's just a clear example of how um, there's so much you can do digitally now um, and not necessarily having to do the uh, walking in face to face to a library to get access to a resource. So thank mm. you for that. And sorry, I cut you off, Kate. Oh, I was just going to say that it's the use of um, technology across the board. So it's not just in accessing the courts filing documents, um, the fact that you can appear, request to appear via Microsoft Teams or video conferencing app or telephone saving you the, the travel. So there's no longer two hours to get to court, two hours to get back from court. Um, you can be sitting at your desk waiting for the registrar or the judge um, to call your matter. There's also the benefit with using technology to access a broader range of client back, your clients. So, um, and, and allowing clients to have a, a conference with their lawyer um, at a time that's more convenient for them, not you know between the hours of nine and five, coming to a law firm, sitting in a conference room, um, you're able to schedule a time to have a video a, a conference with them via a video conferencing app or maybe even over the telephone. Um, you yourself can work. I mean, I work from home um, and then I've got, you know, if I do need uh, an office environment to have, say, a mediation, there's a number of um, office spaces available for short-term rent that have better quality soundproofed conference rooms um, that I've ever worked in it as an employed solicitor locally um, so that I can have that mediation with breakout rooms. Um, and it's and also, I mean, just off the topic, but in relation to mediations, it means both parties know they're attending neutral territory as well. So mm -hmm. technology, I mean, COVID has really finally forced this profession into utilising technology that's actually been there for quite some time. But um, in order to keep dockets or you know for the courts to keep a handle on things when COVID shut everything down we had to use it we had to start figuring out how we're going to sign documents electronically how are we going to continue um, hearing matters um, and I think with time there'll be more software developed applications developed you know you know your phone time records for you you've got your practice management software with you 24 7 um so yeah technology is fantastic i think it's still being underutilized i think we've still got massive things um on the horizon thanks for that kate all very important points and yes quite correct that um uh, as a result of covid we've had the opportunity to um quote unquote get a kick in the butt in terms of use of technology it was always there i remember skype for business but i barely used it um but now um access to microsoft teams and zoom has even given us this opportunity to have a webinar where I'm speaking to all of you in different parts of Australia. We have an audience in different parts of Australia, but we're all able to communicate. And if you, if you take what we're doing now and translate it to legal practice, if we're able to streamline this kind of discussion panel, which would have ordinarily been face-to-face, -face, and it would have been very hard to bring everyone from different parts of Australia into a single room physically, we're now able to do that virtually. So clearly would have the same benefits for streamlining efficiency and access in terms of um, actual legal practice. And I might just move on to you now, Tracy, if there's something you wanted to add to the technology sphere. Yes, I, look, I think that they're all great points. And, and I was just thinking in terms of uh, areas like wills and estates, for example, um, you know, there, there've been a lot of inroads into that area of law, which of course is, is traditionally very, very paper-based. Um, you know, even considering the types of formal requirements we have for people to, to 
you know, make an effective valid will to, to sign their will uh, in, in a lawful manner. Things, things are shifting and there's all these sorts of interesting um, uh, cases where, for example, somebody hasn't made a, a, a traditional formal will, but their intentions with regard to their estate have been accepted because some form of technology has helped to record them, including things like somebody setting out what they want to do with their estate in the notes section on their iPhone. Um, so, you know, technology is constantly shifting and changing when it comes to these very, very ancient, really, uh, areas of law like that. Uh, and and, uh, and I, that won't matter where you practice, you know, technology kind of levels the playing field, I suppose, in that sense. You know, we can we can access resources, we can do things now, identify people, have documents admitted in certain ways that, that we never could have done 20 or 30 years ago. So, and I, and I think that makes it easier and more accessible when you're practising regionally. Uh, I don't think it's a, an obstacle, if it ever was. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Tracy. I think that would be relieving to students who had some concerns in that respect. And I think one of the most important things you mentioned there is that it's leveled the playing field. And I certainly say it has, again, because we're just illustrating that now, having this chat all together via a virtual platform. Now, we are approaching the, close to the end of the webinar. It's only a few minutes to go, but um, I'm gonna ask all the panelists if they have a few extra minutes to stick around. Um, as our audience, please feel free to stick around. I'm gonna ask one more question. Um, and it's sort of going to tie everything off. Um, and I think everything we've discussed will lend itself to the panelists giving some great advice on that. Uh, before I ask that question, I just wanted to let you know that, Paul, I've got a question here from uh, Hannifer. Um, she is in regional Victoria, um, does have some questions. Paul and anyone else from the committee um, that would be um, uh, accommodating to uh, LinkedIn requests, Paul, if Hannah Hannifer wanted to connect with you on LinkedIn just to ask a few questions, would that be yeah, all right? Hundred percent, not a problem. Perfect, Hannifer. Sorry, just because of time constraints and everything, um, feel free to try to connect with uh, Paul online through LinkedIn, and maybe he'll um, help answer some of your questions. And Shelba, yeah. I think I'm really glad that I think the the way that our panelists have been talking about use of technology and working remotely, it seems to have answered your question. Um, so I appreciate that positive feedback. So what I might do to tie it all off at the very end is ask this question, and I'm hoping all of you can respond to it, um, is what advice, after everything we've talked about, what advice do you have for lawyers and law students who want to practice in a regional or rural area? Big, open, encompassing question. But if there's anything you think that pretty, pretty much stands out in terms of that advice perspective, feel free to share now. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. And that is, if you have an opportunity to work in a regional area, don't hesitate. Um, and it is as, as good as, if not a better experience than working um, in the CBD. And that's good to know, Paul, because you, you've had both. So you're able yeah. to provide that comparison. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I would say that uh, if you were disposed to working regionally or rurally, uh, there are many benefits uh, and very few, if any, downsides. Uh, I think the major benefit which I see amongst my cohort is health. Um, I feel that by practicing regionally, I have been able to manage a far better work-life balance. Yeah. Um, when my children were young, I was able to um, go and watch their school plays and go to their presentations and and things of that nature, which was very important for my relationship with them. Uh, and it was seen in a, in my community as a, a very positive thing that, that I would take time out for my practice to go to those events. So that was rewarding um, in that way. Um, and just in terms of health, I've got a number of colleagues who have worked uh, in medium and large sized law firms and they work insane hours uh, and they are really unhealthy and, 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 it's, and their health is catching up with them. They're, they're, whereas I touch wood, um, remain 
quite healthy and and I've never worked those sorts of hours, except on occasions. So everyone gets a case that takes over your life or what have you. But, but generally, I work quite reasonable hours. Uh, I live 10 minutes drive from my home, uh, from my practice rather, uh, and so I don't have the commute. Uh, some practice, practitioners I know who work more rurally, um, travel is an issue for them in that they, they, to see clients or... Uh, they may live out of town and, and, and have a 20-minute drive into town or something like that if they live on a property or what have you. That can be a, an issue. But, but generally, uh, most people who work regionally work um, or live fairly close to where they work and, you know, they don't have a 40-minute train commute to the CBD or what have you. Uh, so I think that work-life balance, there's a lot to be said for that. And I don't think people value that as much as they should uh, because everyone, uh, uh, it's always difficult to get practitioners to come and work in the regions. We, uh, my firm's had this difficulty because we can't attract the wages that people think that they're worth and that large city law firms can afford to pay them. So they, they don't see the, the work-life balance as a reasonable trade-off. They want to earn the big bucks, but that comes at a cost. And it's a question of whether you want to pay that cost, I guess. Some very good points there. It's a balance, balance in lifestyle, balance in convenience, balance in what you want. What are your interests and priorities? Is it money? Is it lifestyle, et cetera? Health, of course. So thanks for touching upon those matters. Um, Kate and Tracy, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, oh, look, okay. great, sorry, great points there, I thought, Andrea. And, and I think, you know, the Sunshine Coast is well known for being a lifestyle area. Um, I guess a couple of things I would say, don't, don't think just because you work regionally that you're sitting around at the beach having a grand old time and, and everybody else is working hard in Brisbane or something like that or wherever you happen to be. It, 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 it doesn't work like that. Um, there's, there's still a lot of work. Um, I, I do think a lot of regional solicitors work smarter because they've got an incentive to also enjoy their lifestyle. And I know a number of extremely experienced solicitors uh, around the Sunshine Coast who do not work later than six o'clock. They go home. They go and watch their kids play cricket. Then they might go for a walk down the beach or something like that because they can. Uh, and they've forced themselves to be working smarter. There's none of this business of sleeping overnight in the office or, or working till 12 or whatever it might be. And I think that's a really good approach to thinking about working regionally. Don't think that it's a soft option or an easy option or, you know, you're being slack or anything like that. That's not the case at all. There are certainly benefits in lifestyle, but you're still doing, still doing the work and still getting the experience. But I think overall what you're really getting is that connection to community and, and the rewards that come with feeling like you, you're actually connected to the people and the place you are working in. Um, that in itself, that underlying sense of satisfaction with what you're doing, I think for me personally, is the key thing, that, that sense of connection, of belonging, of being part of that broader community, uh, and, and feeling like you're, you're actually um, giving to that community. You, you're an important, valuable part of it. That, that's important to me. I don't want to be a number. I've done corporate work, sure, but I, I don't want to be doing that all the time. So that's what I would say just to, to add to what Andrew was saying, which I, I totally agree with. Thanks, Tracy. Kate, is there anything you would like to add? No, I think it's all been said. It's the work-life balance. Um, there are definitely times where I do work crazy hours, but generally speaking, I've been, I feel privileged to be uh, such a, a big part of um, uh, my child's life. I'm, I'm only seven minutes from my office, five minutes from where the school is. Um, um, clients are fantastic. Um, where I work, um, it's just if you do get the opportunity, um, I would jump at it. Um, there is, well, I will recognise, though, that there is that disparity in remuneration, but you do need to remember that perhaps living in regional and remote areas is not as expensive either as living in a CBD. Um, uh, but otherwise, I think everything that I would say has already been said. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Kate. And certainly there's balances and counterbalances there with everything we've talked about, including remuneration. Um, and I did work in a firm um, not too long ago where um, we were running short on staff at one point, and um, one of the lawyer, junior lawyers put up their hand to stay overnight to finish a file. Um, literally, same clothes the next day, um, all day. Uh, and and um, it, it can be hard that way, and it does happen. Um, what I wanted to do was just finish off there as the final question, and I won't hold anyone back um, that wishes to, uh, needs to go because of work that you have or other commitments, but twice I've gotten the same sort of question, and I think it's worth just opening it up for a very quick chat from all of you if you have the time, um, and it just relates to finding work in a regional practice in a regional area, sorry. And because of your experiences, would would um, would you all be able to just give like something very quick and snappy as to say, if you wanted to find a job in a, a regional uh, area, what would you do? Some like very quick points about ways to get connected with people. And uh, of course, solicitors that uh, have practices. I'll go quickly first before I have to shoot off because I've got another matter in the commission in half an hour. Um, and that is, Try community legal centres as a foot in the door. That's how I got into Ballarat. I started working in the community legal centre. That way you build networks as well with local solicitors because they often volunteer. So you get referrals. You also get referrals from the community legal centre and it's good experience. So try that first. Brilliant, thanks, Paul. Again, I've heard from Andrew about that and I think I heard from you as well, Kate or Tracy about the same thing. Um, but is there anything you can, um, anything you can add to what Paul's just said? Uh, can I I'd just probably say, you know, I, I don't want to use the word networking because that sort of has these connotations of going out to functions and cold calling people and all that sort of stuff and, you know, eating some, some sort of cold canapes or something. It, it doesn't work like that. What I was thinking that, particularly in terms of the Sunshine Coast, um, it is all about connection and networking. I mean, people, it's quite a small community, so people often meet each other out at seminars and things like that. But when it comes to being a law student who's hoping to perhaps get some work experience and then subsequently a graduate position, uh, it does help to start connecting to other people, including your own peers at the moment, but lecturers that you come into contact with and solicitors as much as possible. If you meet somebody who's, you know, giving a talk, a barrister, for example, and you've gone out to that talk, go and introduce yourself, get their card, make some contact with them, link up with them on LinkedIn. Uh, I can tell you that personally, I've had two or three solicitors on the Sunshine Coast who quite regularly ring me and ask me if there are any students available for work from the College of Law, they, because they like them. <laughs> so, you know, it's almost like, can I order another one, please? So, you know, that, that's a good thing that, that, that tells you that staying connected to someone you've come into contact with, in this case, me, the lecturer, uh, for my students anyway, has worked out, quite, worked out quite well for them. You know, they've got positions. Thanks very much, Tracy. A bit of a testament to um, our college lecturing staff, of course, that comes from <laughs> that. Andrew and Kate, any final words? Uh, yes, I think um, in New South Wales, I'm not sure how it works in other states, but in New South Wales, we have what are called regional law societies. Uh, and that is a way of connecting with practitioners in your region. Uh, and the regional law society can act as a voice to the, in New South Wales's case, the New South Wales Law Society, uh, where there are issues that people want to bring about the practice of law generally. Uh, and also the law society has a lot of resources for practitioners uh, and particularly junior practitioners and for young lawyers they can join the young lawyers section and meet other young lawyers uh, I did that when back in the days when I was young and uh, and it's amazing the contacts that you make you know from some people that I met as young lawyers and our judges and and you get access to that quality of lawyer throughout your career so so those I think that's a very valuable thing to do um, be mindful too that if you do wish to seek a career in the regions uh, and you want to get that experience that a regional practice can give you very quickly, uh, it's often a very big commitment for a regional firm to put on a junior staff member. Uh, and I think we've all had the experience where someone has come in 
got that experience over one or two years and then gone off to the bright lights. And that can be on occasion a frustrating experience for the for the practitioner, the regionally based practitioner, because it does take, um, if particularly if you take your role as a mentor seriously, uh, to train a person who doesn't have a lot of experience when they first come into the practice is a big drain. Or not, drain's probably the wrong word. It, it takes a lot of resources um, to, to, um, to bring that person on. And then it can be very disappointing. And even though you sort of understand it, that they just move on quickly. So um, probably if you can give an employer maybe a longer term commitment um, to regional practice, that would ease the way as well and maybe open up other job opportunities for you. Thanks, Andrew. A couple of important points there. Um, the first one, of course, being your just your motivation. Do you truly want to be in regional practice? Um, if you want to stay there, what are your long term plans? And maybe that'll give a little bit more confidence to potential employers. And yes, um, having had the benefit of worked at the Queensland Law Society in the past, there's a young lawyer section there. I now deal with one of our College of Law alumni, uh, Alexandra, who's the president of the Law Institute of Victoria, young lawyer section. So great feedback in that respect, Andrew, because it's the same in New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, and I'm certain it's the case in um, South Australia and WA. And we might end off with getting any final words from you, Kate, before, um, uh, no, I think Andrew's suggestion with the local law societies is brilliant. I'm a member of the Verima District Law Society here in the Southern Highlands, um, as well as the Southern Tablelands, which covers um, Goulburn and surrounds. It's where um, once a month we meet um, and have a have a chat. Um, and if you are able to contact the secretary of, of your local law society or the region that you're interested in, um, I wouldn't dismiss completely the concept of, you know, contacting lawyers in the region that you're interested in um, working and um, uh, submitting your resume. Um, I think definitely what Andrew was saying, you do need to recognise that when it's a smaller law firm putting on extra staff, um, uh, there is that kind of hope, wish and desire that that, that that new staff member will stay and be there forever um, because we are, um, I think, more like family environments. You know, I, the firms I've worked in locally have been um, really, really beautiful uh, to work with. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's it. Um, but it's been a, a pleasure being part of this webinar and I'm actually going to have to excuse myself as well. Yes. Yes. Um, but yeah, um, best of luck to everyone uh, out there looking to work in regional and rural New South Wales or the whole of Australasia. Thanks very much, Kate. And thanks very much, everyone. Um, uh, just so our audience knows, everyone who's appeared today as our panelists has volunteered their time. They're busy practitioners. Um, they've got stuff going on. And I'm really grateful on behalf of the College of Law that they made time just to speak with us, to share their insights with you. We've got a lot of questions that have come in and unfortunately, just because at time frame, we don't have time to answer them all, but I hope everything we've discussed will give you a little bit more clarities, hopefully dis demystify some of the concerns you had or, or issues in terms of um, being a regional practitioner. And um, I wanna thank again, all of our panelists. Some of them have been online with me for almost an hour and a half, just waiting to log in. So I'm very thankful you've, you've gone out of your way to be here and to help out. Um, so Paul, I think's um, already off screen, as is Kate. Thank you again, Tracy. Thank you again, Andrew. Absolute pleasure meeting both of you. Um, I've loved this chat. I learned so much from it. And I really hope and believe that um, the students who've attended as audience members have gained invaluable insights from this entire experience. So thank you both. We will stay in touch because I love your work. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, Marco. Thanks, everybody. All the best. Thanks, yes. everybody. Thanks, Marco. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Bye -bye. Good luck.